The Moving Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. You find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. When you partner with Axon, you immediately gain access to a full range of products and solutions designed to meet the complex needs of today's grower. We carry all major brands and sizes of tires and wheels. We specialize in large diameter wheels for large equipment. We have one of the largest OEM replacement wheel inventories in North America. Known for extreme flotation setups, duals, and triples, we have wheels for all makes and models of tractors, sprayers, combines, and grain carts. If we don't have the wheel in stock, we'll custom build, sandblast, and paint in-house. There isn't a more vast inventory in North America dedicated to helping dealers move more iron. With facilities on the West Coast and in the heart of the Midwest, leverage our 230,000 square feet of indoor inventory to solve any problem a grower may have. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hardworking people working hard for you and me. Moving iron time and time again. Through the years you'll find us here. Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast. Markets with Sean Hackett. Sean Hackett is with Hackett Financial out of Boca Raton, Florida, and he's nice enough to come on and talk about what's happening in the world of commodities. Sean, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing good, Casey. Doing really, really good. That's good, man. So we got a few things to talk about today. First, I want to lead off with what we saw happen with wheat last week. So if you look what saw what's going on there, wheat kept wheat, depending on what contract you're looking at, was anywhere from between seventy cents and a dollar up from what we saw there. We saw that. Um movement uh, affect corn and beans not to that effect but within uh probably a 15 cent range you saw some movement there first week they started out um fairly decent saw some uh, profit taking i think towards the end of the week get some things back into situation there and into more of a tighter situation but i guess sean as you're looking at this wheat market here we talked about this a couple weeks ago where if the wheat market started seeing some pressure there could be some short selling uh short covering coming and uh, maybe we saw the start of that last week it's our best rally we've had really, I mean, I'm trying four or five months since we've had a rally like this. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it was a combination of people that were very surprised of the, of the, the ratings drop last week. Everyone was expecting this record crop of all time and things are just amazing. And it was a pretty se severe drop from one week, you know, from, from what was expected. Um, obviously we're moving into the critical period for Russia 
South Russia, mm-hmm. and they've had a lot of dry weather. We've talked about this before. Sure. That at, by by late uh, April we'd start to trade that, and we are. Um, I do think you know, that dry weather can last into mid May, and obviously May is very critical. But I, um, so we put some weather premium on for there. Always geopolitics is always always around, and um, but I guess I guess the whole point is that the market just started to see everything not being perfect, and. Um, and, and going into this critical May timeframe where you really determine what yields are ultimately going to be. And right now there's concern uh, that some of this dry weather in, in the Western KC wheat, wheat belt might continue for you know, well into May. And, um, and um, you know, and so the market all of a sudden decided it was time to put on 70 cents to a dollar and get back to where we were in early mm-hmm. December in, in five trading days. Having said that, you know, that kind of a move, you know, we, we've been suggesting producers need to be making some cash sales here. It's a nice move. It's a big move. We're into overhead resistance. We will start harvesting in, in a little bit over a month. we got a crop tour coming out from the Wheat Quality Board. Most of the time, those crop tours tend to say things are a little better, whether that's ultimately how it turns out, but they'll say things look a little better, disappointing the market. So you have to pick your pick your – pick your battles when you have them. And I think at this point, if you're certainly, if you're a, a wheat producer here in, in the U S and you're behind on your sales, you know, what are you waiting for? I mean, this is a time to get some sales in the books. It doesn't mean it can't go higher. It doesn't mean this is the best price for the year, but you don't have the luxury of waiting forever to get your crop sold. And what you don't want to do is sell it in July when we typically make harvest lows. You know, that's what you don't want to do. So if you don't want to do that, then take advantage of a 70 to 80 cent rally and get some cash sales on the books. So, yeah. Okay. So now taking a look at what happened with the corn and soybean market while we was doing its thing, you saw every day, you know, you'd see, you know, soybeans are up 10 cents one day and they might be up two or three cents the next corn was really kind of back and forth between that one to the five cent range is kind of where it was going each day. I guess looking at those markets, did you see some, I guess, did you see some, uh, picture that was maybe there's going to be some movement a bigger movement in in corn and soybeans as we move forward here the the the, the, the contagion effect was fairly mild and, and it should be fairly mild i mean this really has nothing to do with corn production or soybean production sure. and but but you know you're always going to get a few short-term traders that are that that will buy back the whole group and we saw a little bit yep. of that but for corn you know specifically to get going you know we need the usda to start agreeing with conab about what second crop corn looks like down in South America. Right now we have this massive gaping differential between what the USDA says the crop is down there and what CONAB from Brazil says the crop is. And we just need the USDA to say, yeah, CONAB is more closer to being the truth. That happens in one of these reports. You know, that's how you're going to get a big corn crop move. Right now when you've got this gap, people saying, I don't know what I don't know, I don't know what to do. So they're not they're yeah. not trading it. For better or for worse, right. that's just where we're at. Um very, very, very hard to get anything going during planting season, you know, unless you just have, un, you know, 2019 was probably, you know, one of the worst planting seasons we had with endless rainfall, endless flooding, endless snowpack melt, if you recall. And we couldn't get the market excited to rally until like the last week of May. Um, and we have nothing like that this year. Yeah, there's some areas that are wet and all, but very, very hard to get the, the, the corner soy market excited you know, during planting season, especially when we're off to the one of the fastest starts we've seen in quite a long time, something we've said we would likely do. Um, mm-hmm. The other factor that can move the corn market and the soybean market, you know, certainly would be, you know, if we were to get a cold snap here in mid-May. Remember, it doesn't matter if you get frost today, not enough of the crops emerged. But, it, you know, in mid-May, we'd have a tremendous amount of the crop emerge, and that's how you get the crops into trouble and damage with frost. Is if you get a frost when there's uh, when the when the when the you know corn or soybeans have emerged. So, uh, so right now it's a wheat story. Um, could be a corn story if USDA knocks the Brazilian crop down here in the next crop report here, and uh, I guess it's next week. And um, soybeans are just struggling to, to find a reason. Certainly, frost would do it. But they're the least exciting market right now, given the overall framework from what we're looking at. I just it's the hardest thing to come up with a reason why soybeans should r- rally right now. I think corn and we have much better reasons for doing it. Okay. All right. So you sent me a text message last week. We were kind of 
uh, on, on where the current situation with the FDA is concerning um, beef production and the avian flu. And according to some of the samples that it came back from commercial milk sampling studies by the USDA, um, they're, they're because of the pasteurization process, the uh, H5N1 avian flu uh, did not show up in, in, in that milk. So I guess thoughts on that, you know, then you have Columbia down here, you, an article you sent me as well, that had Columbia had become the first country to restrict U.S. beef due to bird flu and well, dairy cows. So I guess from a demand, from a demand a side standpoint, to say yeah. pasteurization works, it deactivates any fragments, you're not going to get sick, it's safe. If any milk happens to get into the into the into uh, you know into the supply chain, you're 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 safe. And we're doing our very best not to let that happen. And we're going to restrict and make sure we test every animal to make sure that doesn't happen. But even if it does happen, in minor cases, you're covered. I think that's very good that we're not going to see demand crash because people are worried about getting sick drinking milk. Um, right. Having having said that, uh, you know it is spreading uh, as as one would expect, and and. The only reason that Colombia could be important is Colombia doesn't buy a lot of beef from the U.S. It's, it really doesn't matter fundamentally. What matters is do people, you know, do people follow along uh, the leader here, and or and other people start restricting um, exports of um, of beef, and, and you know, I don't think they will, Casey. But you know, once one country does it, then it, it gives everyone else a. Um, a reason to think about doing it. And so if we were to get somebody like Japan or Korea or somebody who really buys a lot of uh, beef from the United States to do it, you know, that could have a material impact. So it's just something to watch. I don't, I, you know, I, I don't know quite frankly, I don't know why Colombia is doing it. It doesn't make any sense to me. We have not seen any beef cows having it other than in dairy. And, um, and uh, if you're going to test every animal, I, you know, to me, it just seems like a gross overreaction. A problem we're going to reverse course. I think fairly soon. I just don't see any rationale why they would do it. But, but you know, in the world we live in, can, you know, contagion is your friend. You, you just have to worry that other people, you know, see that. So maybe we should do it too. You know, right? Yep. Okay. All right. Let's bounce over. Talk a little bit about. I want to get your opinion on what we see happening in the energy market right now. So if you look at where what oil's done. <clears throat> seen it kind of bounce around back and forth a little more volatility than we've seen in the past i guess as you're looking at the oil market obviously we're heading into the summer driving season and all that stuff that goes in that but we've seen um you know the price of oil bounce up you talked about this um about two or three weeks ago when you had you started talking about um <clears throat> some of the different movements in the in the uh, with the dollar and how these things are, are lining up so i guess as you're looking at the energy market sean what do you see happening there look we we, we pumped the market up to 85 86 on geopolitics you have to keep feeding right. pounds of flesh to the bulls to keep them excited. Right. But now we're talking about mm -hmm. uh, some kind of a ceasefire negotiations going on as we speak that might calm those fears down. And that's not what the oil market wants to hear. We want to hear it. I mean, I want to hear it. I, I mean, we want to hear that we're deescalating. But the oil market, to stay up at 85 to 6, it needs to see things are getting worse. Things are getting more out of control. There's more bombs getting closer to Saudi Arabia. And if they're going to do a ceasefire or it looks, you know, of course, that could all change this afternoon. They say the deals are off and we're going to go bomb everything again. But right now, it looks right. like a deescalation. So they're selling Corral off. If there is a ceasefire agreement, you can... I think it's a reasonable bet based upon that that you'd see oil come back in the seventy-five to seventy-eight dollar area, where I think the actual fundamentals support the market. So right now, you know, I, I mean, unless you're really, really good and you have a direct um, cell phone for, to Saudi Arabia or Iran or or or, or the Israeli government, you know, unless you have that inside information, you know, I, it's pretty hard to um, to. Uh, figure on what's going to happen next because it's all geopolitical at this point. And my best bet is we're probably going to have a little bit of a ceasefire, a little bit of a calming, a little bit of a of a of, a, of an impasse. It just seems like the unrest going on here in the U.S., for example, and all these riots going on. You know, I, I think the Biden administration doesn't like how that looks as he's trying to get elected again. And so I think he's trying to, to calm things down and, and to the extent he's able to. So my best bet is that things are going to calm down for a bit, and oil probably corrects into that $75, $78 level. 
and then we need to take another look at it. That would be my feeling about it at this point, given what I think's going on geopolitically. So, right on. Okay. Well, Sean, that's kind of what I had on my list. Anything else you want to throw out there for people that are listening that you well, want to make sure a, that you know, we, we have an, uh, an FOMC uh, meeting decision here on Wednesday. You know, uh, it's not it's not really what they do; it's what they say, right? Um, it's fully expected they're right. not going to yep. they're not going to lower rates. <clears throat> and but you know what do they actually say? You know, right now a lot of markets are selling off because they're afraid that they're going to say something they don't want to hear. Um, so you know we'll just have to see. Uh, that comes out Wednesday afternoon, and and uh, you know the, the the U.S. dollar and everything else. Uh, it, there's a lot of uh, ca- a capital flows moving around based upon you know what they think. Chairman Powell's going to say so. Keep an eye on that. Um, it, 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 you know, it is important where the markets are right now to, um, you know, to kind of lay the foundation for whether or not we really are done with any hope for a rate cut, or if a rate cut is still possible. I, and I think the market wants to hear that a rate cut is still possible, and um, you know, we'll see, we'll see how he tries to. Uh, Dance over the tulips on this one. We'll see what he has to say uh, tomorrow. But but it's gonna it's gonna move the markets. And right yep. now people are selling because you know we've had some tough inflation numbers, some economic numbers that have been uh, confusing, and so you know the market just is just uh, a little. There's a lot of anxiety. We've seen a lot of the big tech stocks correcting big time in the AI sector, which gets people nervous. You know, it's just uh, just something to watch. You know, I know we get one of these every month, but this particular one I think is pretty important because we, you know, we we're moving into the final window towards elections, and the U and the the Federal Reserve has to decide how they're going to play their chips. You know, because obviously the chairman is put there by the pleasure of the president, and you know, they as much as we think they're independent, they do play politics. I know that for a fact they play politics, and how do they want to play the politics? I think he has to state clearly what they intend to do, not necessarily based upon what is necessarily the most sensible based on the data, but what he's intending to do, what makes sense based on the politics, because that's really what ultimately drives them when you're this close to a political election. I think this is a very important statement, because I think whatever he says now, I don't think he can back away from. So, Right. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of late in the game to start. Yeah, I mean, we're here. We, you know, we're, we're here. You know, beginning nope. of May. I, I think he's got us. He has yeah. determined what I what am I going to do. I need to lay it out clear, and and then I'm going to go out ahead and do it. And and he's meshing. He's trying to balance the data with politics with keeping his job. And I think whatever he says today is going to tell you what he, where he's at on that. Or maybe he's just want. He's just he says I'm done. I'm heading out. I don't care. And maybe he's just going to throw throw everyone under the bus and say, "Screw it, I'm I'm not capitulating to politics." He may say that. Either way, we need to know what his intentions are heading in to the elections. And so I think that'll have a lot to do with what the dollar does, commodities do, precious metals do, the stock market does. It's it's. A, I think he's going to have to make a long term statement. And um, I don't think he can kick the can down in the road by saying it's going to be data driven. I don't think he can do that anymore. He's got to say what he's going to do. Right. And, you know, first of the month here, first of April, there were three uh, governors that said, hey, you know, I think we need to raise rates again. So very, yeah. It'll yeah. Be interesting I mean, what this, when this comes out. Very interesting to see where yeah. His, yeah. his head is at. So, other right. than that, <clears throat> yep. I think that's all I know today. So, <laughs> all right. You know more than I do. All right, Sean. <laughs> if, folk, if folks want to reach out Twitter to you, uh, what's the best Fair way to do that? 11. Website hack at h a c k e t t advisors dot com. You know, from time to time, we put interviews and different things out there that might be helpful to give people an idea of how we look at the world with our cycle statistics and correlations to see if what we do might be of value to what they're doing in agriculture. Well, Sean, appreciate you being on. We'll try to catch you again next this week here coming up. All right. Thanks, Sean. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Moving Iron LLC. Go to LinkedIn at Moving Iron Podcast. Check out the video version of this podcast over on the YouTube channel, which is at the Moving Iron Podcast YouTube channel. And you can also check us out on TikTok at Moving Iron Podcast as well. Go to Moving Iron LLC for everything Moving Iron related. All the information for the Moving Iron Summit will be up here 
you can sign up and all that now, but you can, all the information will be up here directly. So you can check out what that looks like. Sean will be there. He do one of his uh, breakout sessions, and we'll uh, go from there uh, with him on uh, what's going to happen in uh, end of 24 going into 25. So looking forward to that. So with that, I'm Casey Seymour, Sean Hackett. Let's go with some iron, folks. Out. Iron Podcast is brought to you by these great sponsors. Are you looking to value your equipment more accurately? Target the right buyers and close more deals? Reach your ideal customer? Then look no further. Fusible isn't just about ag data. It's about action. Our best-in-class solution empowers you to value your equipment accurately, make informed decisions, and find the perfect prospects. Ignite your dealership's growth at fusible.com slash moving iron dash podcast. Out in the field, every decision counts. You wouldn't plant without testing your soil, so why would you prospect blind? Introducing EDA, your one-stop shop for ag equipment intel. EDA goes beyond specs and prices. You get deep dive data on every piece of equipment like UCC filings that help track ownership changes and uncover potential sales leads. D&B firmographics, which help you understand the financial health and buying power of potential customers. Market trends that help you stay ahead of the curve and insights on equipment demands and pricings. With EDA, you're not just looking at data, you're seeing opportunity. Find the right buyer, sell smarter, and build lasting relationships. Visit edadata.com for your free demo and unlock the power of knowledge. For over 80 years, Iron Solutions has been your go-to data source for ag dealers, lenders, and manufacturers. Get powerful appraisal and value forecasting tools that fuel profitable decisions anytime, anywhere. Get your free demo at ironsolutions.com. Iron Solutions, confidence in every click. Today, there are many ways to finance ag equipment. But nobody delivers simple, fast, or flexible financing like AgDirect. Learn more about your options to buy, lease, and refinance equipment at agdirect.com. Valley Transportation has been hauling ag and construction equipment across the country for the past 33 years. Call Parker at 800-657-4910 for all your trucking needs. At Valley Transportation, our goal is to help you reach yours. This podcast is proudly provided by Axon, helping dealers move more iron for the past 100 years. Find out more at axontire.com. Move more iron with Axon. Moving iron in the 21st century. Hard work.